So I'm Bala Pile. I'm uh, affiliated with uh, Sadi as a coach for the Sia Pumalela project. I'm formerly from UKZN. <clears throat> I'm currently an emeritus professor. And uh, it's good to see my neighbors down the road uh, taking charge of the session from DUT. So welcome. Uh, so colleagues, uh, I'm going to start off by uh, thanking my support, uh, Nasha and Ephraim. Thank you very much from Sadi. Uh, okay, so I must say that I'm enjoying this uh, conference uh, quite a lot. It's really got some very positive energy. And uh, we are now in the third session and uh, we're continuing with some of the discussion we started this morning. Uh, and our first speaker will be uh, one, one Bile Kumalo, who spoke earlier on, and uh, Shubnam Rambaras. Uh, are we going to be projecting the title uh, on the screen, please? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Bala, and good afternoon, colleagues. Um, as introduced, my name is Mzwandi Kumalo, and of course, I will be working with my colleague uh, Shabnam Ramaros on this presentation. And it's work in progress, uh, but really, we're going to be sharing a lot of data that we have received thus far from our students, particularly in the work that we are doing, which is an extension or a continuation of the Sugusegele project or program. Uh, that we are doing where we are trying to unsilence the student voices, particularly in um, core design, designing or co-creating student development initiatives. So in this um, uh, presentation, we're going to be sharing just a little bit of the data that we have received, particularly around um, what students are saying is existing at the moment at DUT, and also a little bit about their own experiences as well and the kinds of initiatives that they would want us to, uh, 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 to include. And of course, as I've said, this is the first phase of the data that we are collecting, but um, the second phase then would be us then using the, the, the design thinking tool, particularly um, to work with the students then to design prototypes or models of um, programs that we would then uh, implement here at DUT. So our presentation uh, around- if you could just leave five minutes at least for questions. So okay, sure. we'll finish five minutes before. Thank you very much. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. So our presentation is around co-creating the first year student experience program for enhanced impact and particularly unsilencing the student voices in the design of student development initiatives. Okay, so as part of the introduction, really, I won't dwell much on this slide, but I think what is important is us developing a better understanding, particularly uh, on how we nurture uh, student um, access and also success to powerful ways of knowing, but also the holistic sort of definition of what student success means. And I think from the presentation that we've got um, from the colleague from CHE, he touched a lot that student success isn't really just about the marks, but also the demonstration of the DET graduate attributes and demonstration of many other sort of factors that contribute to what we'll refer to as a holistic um, uh, uh, sort of success of the student. A little bit of the uh, theoretical background, particularly the work that we are doing at DUT is centered around trying to understand where students are in the spectrum of their own development, but also their identity and culture in how they view themselves um, around the university. And I think this is very much deeply embedded then on Envision 2030, which, is, which would be the strategic direction of the university to say, one, we need to make sure that our people um, uh, has a sense of being connected and also they then can account uh, particularly for their actions and for the works that they are doing as part of the university. So that is why on the first quadrant here, I speak of the idea of the self, um, uh, which speaks of stewardship. It speaks about students then finding an identity um, and also understanding that they belong somewhere. And in this instance, we are saying they are belonging to DET. 
Um, but also in the second quadrant, then you'd find that there are students who are more focused on their academic ach achievements and they are more about the grades. And so um, these are then the students that aren't really participating in core curricular activities and many other um, sort of developmental initiatives, but they really are more about their own marks. So there's less of what is it that makes them employable beyond just the, the academic results that they would, they would have or even the certificate. And I think we'll share a little bit about this um, when we now look into the student voices and what they say around, you know, just not only focusing on the grades, but also being able to demonstrate other attributes um, that then builds them to be this holistic, uh, stu uh, uh, successful student as well. Um, so on this other quadrant, we speak of students who have good participation and they actively are involved and they have a sense of pride. But the ultimate goal to where we're trying to drive our students is them being active and also being holistic and professional as well. Um, over to you, Shabs. Thank you so much, as well. So for this a particular exercise that we are, uh, are doing with our first year students, um, our student leaders, as well our, as our tutor mentors and advisors, is to actually engage them um, in the development process um, and to get a greater involvement from our students. So we're actually doing things, they are doing things with us rather than us doing things on them. So we've drawn on um, this particular uh, concept of uh, students as partners and particularly partnership in learning and teaching. And this comes from uh, Cook and uh, Cook Sather, Bovo and Felton. And they describe uh, stu student partners, uh, uh, student partnership as a collaborative reciprocal process through which all participants have the op opportunity to contribute equally although not necessarily in the same ways to curricular or pedagogical conceptualization, decision-making, implementation, investigation, or analysis. So really what we'd like to do is involve our students in co-creating um, and to give them an opportunity to contribute um, equally though, but, but differently. So we, we, we'd like to have an equality of respect and equality of possibility in the development of the support programs that we offer to our students. Uh, next slide, please, as well. So related to that, then we would like to, we, we also draw on this definition of curriculum co-creation co from Lubitsch Naraka. And she says that staff and Curriculum co-creation is about staff and students working together in an ongoing reciprocal, creative and mutually beneficial process to negotiate and share decision-making. So this now brings in the creativity and it's based on shared values and negotiation between staff and students about what should be included in the programs that we are developing for them. And very much, uh, in this definition of co uh, curriculum co-creation is the aspect of collaboration, uh, of respect, of valuing what everyone brings to the table. So we are, we would like to involve students in the development of our programs, but we'd like to uh, be, be inclusive and to include in that working relationship the partnership principles of respect, responsibility, and reciprocity. So the, so the programs have to be mutually beneficial for both us as staff and for the students. So both of these definitions then are, are what we're actually drawing on because it's about involving students in a partnership where they are actually co-designing and co-creating the program so that uh, the programs that we have been developing in the, in the past uh, for their success. So they now become uh, ac active students. Uh, they are totally engaged. They, they participate in this development, and not only in, in the curriculum, in the development of the curriculum, but they are actually participating in these programs as well. 
So it's involving students as change agents and as partners and as students and students as producers uh, as well. Uh, next slide, uh, Nzwa. So what the methodology that we've we've employed for for this process is the design thinking uh, methodology. And design thinking is a process for solving complex real world problems, but it actually prioritizes the user's needs, the participants' needs. And as the developers of these programs, uh, our students are the active participants. They are actually the, the consumers, the, um, uh, the users. So the, with them being so embedded in their experiences in higher education, they would be ideal, uh, ideally placed to actually develop the programs with us. And because design thinking uh, relies on observing with empathy, so it's the, it, for us, it, it was the most relevant methodology for us to use to, to get them involved in the process of developing the programs. So with the design thinking, we, we observed and we deeply embedded in how people interact with their environments. It's very iterative. So we come back to, so we, from identifying the problem, uh, from developing possible solutions, we come back to see how we can improve it. And with this iterative process, it's, it's a continuous cycle that's continue, continuously improving on our programs. So it's a hands-on approach for in, of, of creating innovative solutions. And the focus is on achieving practical results and solutions. So like um, um, co-creation and uh, students as partners, it's an interpersonal um, action and involves taking into account perspectives, uh, coordinating those perspectives as well of all of the users involved, the participants involved. Uh, as with students as partners and co-creation, it's a collaborative process and it's about processing all of the information that they've collected uh, using contextual thinking. So at the very beginning of this pilot uh, study that we have done, some of the results that we've, uh, we've, we've obtained from the initial um, engagements with students are the following. So uh, onto the next slide, please. So what we've done is we've involved our students as um, uh, in order for us to uh, reimagine our student development initiatives, we've involved uh, a cohort of student leaders uh, residents, advisors, first year students, as well as returning students. And we've gathered some uh, information from them so that what we'd actually like them to do is to, um, to understand that learning is meaningful. Uh, we'd like them to have the, the, the freedom as students to make choices. Um, so that they understand that our relationships are collaborative and it's based on dialogue. Uh, and that we're viewing students as knowledgeable and critical partners in the learning process. And the benefits we, we're trying to achieve is that students will feel valued, uh, that there is an enhanced uh, academic performance, but there's a shift in focus from grades to learning uh, because there's now an increased relevance of the programs that we are offering to them because it's contextualized to their needs and what they see as important for them. But also important is that it's now culturally responsible and it's inclusive. Uh, so let's have a look at some of the results uh, that we've got from this interaction with students. So the the, the, as I said, we had uh, residence uh, advisors, we had student leaders. So the residence advisors and student leaders, we had 100, uh, a cohort of 150 students. The first year students was a cohort of 45 students and our tutor mentors and advisors was a cohort of 56 students. So some of the themes that emerged from the initial interaction with them 
uh, we actually had in the design thinking process, we had them interact on a mirror board uh, about four particular questions. And the first question was about their expectations of university. And the first theme that came out very strongly was the newness of higher education because they were expecting to see new things. They, want, they were expecting to meet new people and to learn new things. Um, next, uh, thank you. And because of the, the newness, they, they, were, they, they found that the uh, courses were quite challenging, uh, but this is what their perceptions were. So again, it's delving into the, their perceptions about higher education and their courses. So they thought that the course was going to be difficult. They expected it to be hard. Um, and they honest, this particular student felt that they were, uh, you know, we, we look focusing on, on perceptions here. So it's their perception of coming to the city and they honestly thought that they were going to get mugged every day since I'm from the rural area. So uh, that's something for us to be concerned about in terms of uh, counteracting these perceptions. Next slide, Mswa. And then very, very strongly what came, um, came out was their frustrations with un online learning. Um, they actually expected to be uh, to be having face-to-face -face lectures. And then because of um, uh, all of our shutdowns, our, our protests and so on, we had to go um, only for, for online learning. And uh, this is what the students have said, that I thought that everything will be fine since we're in higher education until we're introduced to online learning. Um, they were not familiar with the technology. Uh, and uh, I found this particularly interesting that uh, they had to cope with the stress of being one of the top students in high school. And now they're fighting, they, they, uh, you know, they're struggling to obtain their 50% in their modules. And so they're saying varsity is very draining. Uh, and again, they're saying, coming out strongly again, is that this online thing is not easy at all. And um, th that was a, a big issue for them that they struggled, that the data was not available and so on. And then the second question we looked at was their experiences of the first semester. And the positive things was that, that their lecturers were so loving and caring, that they were patient with them and that they helped. Uh, next point, please. Well. They were also involved. So in spite of all of these stresses, they still made time to get involved with the co-curricular activities. And they say that their experience was interesting and that they got involved in the institution, not only academically, but with sports and leadership. And the other um, concern that they had was about uh, navigating a new experience on their own. Uh, for the first time, I think, in their lives, they've been away from family, away from friends. They were living on their own with new people. They were sharing uh, accommodation with more than one person. Uh, and it was a very new experience for them. And also dealing with personal issues. What particularly came through was the um, uh, issue of dealing with me uh, me uh, mental wellness uh, that they were drawing on there. And Again, strongly, very, very strongly came through the challenges of adapting to online learning. It was very confusing and very stressful. Um, they couldn't submit um, assignments on time. They had network issues. There was uh, uh, also, they didn't have the correct technology. Um, my first experiences was hell, but the lecturers were patient with me and helped me. Next one, please, Bob. Um, again, tough time adapting to online learning. It was difficult uh, and it's tough, I don't want to lie. But in spite of all that, they also suggesting to us that things that we need to do. So they want us to, to have an automated bot, a chat bot that can answer every question you have while the lectures are offline. So picking up, the, this actually is, is in sync with what uh, Tim was talking about yesterday when in the, in the keynote. And you know, that's something that we all need to think about is developing this chatbot. Uh, next aspect, please, Laura. And 
some of them are saying it wasn't that bad, um, but the other, there were other challenges that they experienced, like the floods, load shedding, network issues, data problems, uh, and not receiving the data that was made available for them. Thanks, Amzor. Next one. But the ultimate goals was that this passionate desire to succeed and to, uh, so they're highly motivated. They want to achieve distinctions. Uh, and all of them are talking about finishing in record time, in the minimum time. So they want cum laude uh, distinctions. They want to make a better life for their parents as well, who've made sacrifices to send them to university. And this characteristic uh, uh, was coming out as well from our TMAs, and so on, the next aspect, and which ties into what the students were saying is that they are, these students are actually young, they're ambitious, and they are on their way to, uh, they've got lots of potential, and they want to achieve success in life. Uh, they as tutors, they want students to be the best possible people they can be, um, but they also want them to be ethical and to uh, add value to humanity. And they've got career aspirations for these students as well. They want them employed in big organizations, but also they were mentioning things about uh, entrepreneurship and so on. Uh, one more, please, well. Thank you. Oh, there we go. And and the next one. Yeah. And so there was this, this was a, a particular, particularly um, uh, nice uh, goal that resonated with, with us that they see themselves as a lecturer at DUT. So, um, and what they want to do is uh, they, they are not fast funded, but they'd also like to get a part time job so that they could have a monthly living allowance because some of them are sending money home as well to support their family. Thanks, Mzoa, next one. So then going on to the co-creation bits, so we asked them what support would they need uh, in addition to what we're providing for them. And very similar to what we've, we've been offering them, they're picking up on things like uh, extra lessons or the tutorial support, uh, group uh, group projects and group learning and importantly a one on one on one sessions with their lecturers they also would like additional work uh, so that um, and lecturers checking up on their progress but also the tutoring so that uh, they develop their communication skills and that there's better understanding uh, next one uh, and then these are coming from the tutors that they would like to support the students by keeping track of their participation uh, and to get feedback about their challenges, to give them direction and also to uh, teach them problem solving skills so that they now become independent problem solvers. Next one, Mzor. Uh, uh, finish, please. Oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Mzor, if you could just put the others on and then I won't read too much through them. And then what they were picking up on that they would like in, in their programs is career advice uh, and programs that actually assist them before they come to, to university about the choices they're making about their diplomas. Uh, so I think I hand over, back over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I'll just fly through this slide. And then this was the work that we've done with the house committees. And one of the questions that we asked them was, um, with you guys understanding where you are, understanding your ambitions and what you want to be, how would you define then a person who is successful, particularly um, now in the living and learning communities and particularly the work that we are doing in residences? And some of the uh, uh, responses then was a person who is successful or a student who is successful at DET, they should be a student who is financially wise, who care about their grades, who is willing to improve and learn new things and also take opportunities when they are offered. Um, one then says DUT attributes, we want students to embody the, the, the graduate attributes from their attitudes, language, tones, and behaviors. They must not be graduates by certificates, but also um, by the knowledge that they actually hold. And a student with an argument to initiate and adapt to changes. This, of course, um, also is an extension to 
um, what Envision 2030 actually outlines, particularly around the stewardship um, um, perspective as well. There was also, um, um, we then asked them what sort of programs already are existing at DUT, which then fosters your definition of what student success actually is. And these were some of the programs that they were mentioned, particularly around academic supports. This would be the tutorials that we offer, technology for learning and also the first year student experience and more on the co-curricular uh, sort of psychosocial activities. Uh, they were mentioning literacy around debate, financial literacy, Guna Leadership Academy and many other initiatives that we have really, which are student led. But I want to speak briefly now on the new programs that the students actually want us to uh, to introduce, they speak of institutional culture, uh, having talks that are student led really around institutional culture. And the talk around this one really uh, emanated from the issues of strikes that were happening on campus. And they want then as students to build a DUT that actually uh, has a, a, an identity that actually speaks to them. Um, interestingly, also those students were selling, saying skills development programs such as practical work, uh, carpentry, uh, welding, beadwork, and all the kinds of works um, really that, and, and the kinds of skills that we would give to our students. Uh, there were a lot of talks around application development and students are kind of more towards the idea that every student should have at least basic understanding of app um, uh, development and also the use of technology. Um, they were talking of having green dialogues, food security programs, and I'm sure the presentation after this one would speak to this and also self-empowerment or even uh, business Sundays where students would just meet and they share ideas on the different businesses and the different um, sort of entrepreneurial journeys they actually that students are actually part of. Um, a lot of the mental health talks, and I think particularly because we have a number of cases now in the residences around mental health. And so uh, the student leaders then in residences were also mentioning that, but also interestingly, uh, there, was, there were a lot around talent shows because students are saying a lot of the work that is being done uh, within the university is more about the academic work and there's less that is being done around um, uh, 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 making sure that we create platforms for them to showcase their talents. Um, in conclusion and recommendations, of course, as we've said, this is the first phase of the data and really trying to understand where students are. Then the next phase would be us creating a case study particularly based on what students have provided us and the data that we've shared. And then we'll train students on design thinking and using what they would have given us um, as the data that we presented to then design case studies to which then the students will come up with prototypes or models on how we can actually implement a program such as the uh, first year student experience program, but also the holistic student support initiative as well. Uh, thanks so much, colleague. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting uh, presentation. I, I think we, we're we really seeing a lot of the student input uh, through these presentations. Thank you very much for that. Uh, are there any questions uh, from our colleagues? You may raise your hand. I saw nothing on the chat. Um, if you would like to ask a question. Uh, in the meantime, can I ask, uh, how, how would you see this being implemented? I know it's a pilot. Uh, project at this stage, uh, but has there been any thought in terms of the implementation, uh, the resources that's required, the then obviously the intent uh, by the institution and also your colleagues, uh, mainly the academic uh, colleagues, uh, you know, do you see any, any buy-in from there? Or what would be the challenges? Okay, so the idea really at this stage is just um, because we have uh, uh, the first year student experience program. Um, we also have the holistic student support initiatives as well. And so the idea then is for us to try and programmatize these initiatives in such ways that students actually sees relevance to these particular programs. Because um, like for instance, the FYSE program is an already existing program. However, we are saying it has been conceptualized about 10 years ago. And the question that is behind everything is, 
is, it, is the content that we're still covering under the FYSE still relevant to the cohorts of students that we actually have now? And so within the models that the students would create and that they would design, we'll then look into it and, 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 and actually consult with staff and also with, with other students as well to say, which of these models do they find working very well for us particularly, and also making sure that it, it does um, uh, 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 work for, for, for the students that will be attending then these programs. Um, in terms of the, the recruitment for students, um, it was mainly self-selected students um, and also us then visiting different classes and the different students that we actually are engaging with. And some of the students, we only got them, for instance, like the um, uh, tutors, it was through the trainings that we do with them. And so as part of the activities that we were doing uh, in the trainings, we we'll then ask them these kinds of questions. And then also in terms of the student leaders, it was through their induction and, and us also trying to make sure that we, they see their position, particularly in the network of student support and the role then that they would have to play. But we have to know that they understand what their role is and them also being able to, um, uh, to, to, to collaborate. So yes, the data, we're still continuing with the collection of the data and we are meeting with different cohorts of students. But um, um, for now, it has been first year students it has been uh, tutor mental advisors and also the uh, house committee as well and other aids. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and I see you also answered uh, Clue's question. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, well done. We're going to stay at DUT. And the next presentation is by Marcos Zana, Twyla, Swandile, and Koo Parker. Reflections on the One Residence, One Garden project at DUT, I think that's becoming very important, especially in view of the, the, the supply chain challenges to basic foodstuffs. So over to you. Good day colleagues. My name is Kosi Twala and I am currently overseeing the Green Campus Initiative. I'll be touching on the reflections of the One Residence, One Garden project. So the Green Campus Initiative was conceptualized in the year 2011, following the UN Climate Change Conference that was held in Durban. And it was launched at DUT on the 25th of August, 2012. It's formed by students and staff with the aim of addressing issues of environmental sustainability at DUT. So there are various programs that are led by the Green Campus Initiative, which focus on promoting educational awareness, enhancing change, greening the curriculum. We're looking at development and implementation of green programs. So there are various programs such as the Green Inter Entrepreneurship in Daba. We've got a Green Innovate competition, whereby students are able to come up with prototypes that they um, showcase uh, and uh, they get prizes for that. We've got the Green Fashion Show, whereby students are designing um, garments out of recycled material. There's safe water initiatives, energy conservation, as well as um, another aspect that is very close to GCI, which is recycling and waste production. But particularly for today, I'll be touching on the One Residence, One Garden project, which is looking at sustainable food solutions. So with the One Residence, One Garden project, as I've already said, it's a student-led initiative and the objectives of this project are putting students at the center of resolving their own challenges. So with this particular initiative, we are focusing on food security as well as healthy living. The project seeks to help alleviate food scarcity and hunger amongst students by responding directly to the uneven economic, food, uh, economic growth, food uh, insecurity, as well as poverty that is being experienced. So with this initiative being driven by students, it's aimed at improving nutritional levels and livelihoods by allowing students to have the ability to produce healthy foods and the, for consumption and for the sale of surplus crops. So with the understanding, I think with the, how the project came about was with the understanding that um, some students are receiving allowances through NSFAS or through their bursaries, but some of these students coming from child-headed households, some of the students having to be the main uh, breadwinners at home, having to send uh, food uh, money home for food, then leaving them with the bare minimum to survive. So this is where the project came uh, about. So the problem that's being addressed is 
we know that residences are places for living and learning, and it's often exposed to the students that some of the classroom experiences extend beyond, which includes the food insecurity aspects as well as healthy living. So as I've already touched on, we had an increase with mental health cases because students were struggling with um, some of the challenges that they had in terms of having to send money home. And hence, this was a project that was brought about through our, stu our, our students from the Green Campus Initiative. The impact of the One Residence, One Garden on student success. So with understanding our students as developing human beings, we understand that our students can't be studying on empty stomachs as this might have a negative impact on the academic performance. So with the One Residence, One Garden project, the focus is on the holistic understanding of students and the fact that the student success is more than the academic success in order to ensure that the DUT graduate attributes are, are ensured. So just to maybe touch on the DUT graduate attributes that we have here at DUT, first and foremost is critical and creative thinkers who work independently and collaboratively, knowledge practitioners, effective communicators, culturally and environmentally and socially aware within the local and global context, as well as active and reflective learners. And you'll see from some of the work that's being done that through the One Residence, One Garden project, we are actually able to see some of these DUT graduate attributes into full realization. So how the project works is that, as I've touched on, it's a student-led initiative that is coordinated by the GCI. And it's run by students within the residences. However, as part of the GCI network, it's not only made up of students for the residences. So the call is normally sent out to students from across the, the institution. We've got our residence advisors from the residences who are also available to support, as well as the GCI executive, which are the lead team made up of students who are leading on this project, as well as GCI representatives from across the residences who are also involved. All these team members are involved in terms of ensuring the sustainability of the project. So as much as the project is housed at the Student Housing and Residence Life Office, it is a project that is, um, that is being reached to students across um, all campuses, which is in DUT, and our Midlands and um, Durban campus. So the students have conceptualized innovative ideas on how to establish gardens, which are not bound to space in both DUT and owned um, outsourced residences. So even with the gardening project, it's not only our traditional gardens that are, have been created here, but with some of the projects, students have come up with innovative ways to, to establish gardens. So there's gardens established and managed by students within the residences. So this is, um, if I may just give some sort of background, the, the GCI exec is involved in terms of expanding towards the residences. But then once they get to the residences, they provide that support to the GCI representatives. And then the GCI representatives would then have to work with the community within that residence to be responsible for managing the gardens on a weekly basis. So students harvest and consume the vegetables grown in the gardens, but it's particularly for students in need. But with the project, um, last year we established it around July, 2021, but it was a pilot project. And with the pilot project, the harvesting season was around um, November, 2021. So we were not able to particularly uh, assist students that were particularly in need. Um, but however, for, for distribution purposes, the, the, the vegetables were given to students across, but the hope is to be able to assist our students who are in need for future. So the One Residence, One Garden project at the moment is made up of 105 uh, members. 42% of those students are male and 58% are female while about 40% is made up of our first year students. And the faculty that seems to be dominating at the moment is the accounting and informatics faculty. I'd just like to play this video to just show you some of the work that is actually being done by the students.
Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Thank you very much. So just to touch on um, what has been done, a survey was, was, was done in the beginning of the year, it was sometime the first term of this year, we administered a survey to the ORAG participants. The purpose of the survey was to gather some feedback on the students' experiences with regards to the One Residence, One Garden project, but also to gather some sort of feedback on how or to what extent can um, have students benefited from the project, but also to look at how can we improve in terms of the One Residence, One Garden project. And what was uh, the response rate was about 78% from the students that participated, that completed the survey. So maybe to just um, show you some of the data that we have in regards to faculty representation, we can see that um, the faculty of the management sciences, students from um, the management sciences seem to have completed the survey and then participation by level of study. What's interesting at the moment is that our first years seem to be actively involved in this project. And um, with, the, with the, the executive members, some of the first year students are actually also forming part of, uh, part of um, the One Residence, One Garden project. So with the remaining latter part also completed the study. So with regards to the benefits of participating in the project, there was a few themes that have come about. And just to touch on the impact on mental health as well as the physical well-being, what it was indicated here was that um, we had some students showing they strongly agree with the following topics, which was uh, that the project increased their perception and well-being, as we had about 63% of students strongly agreeing to this. We had project increased my levels of physical activities and exercise. The project, project was therapeutic way for me to take some time off my studies. My knowledge of healthy eating and its benefits were increased. And this was also interesting because from the survey, we also found that a lot of students were also indicating that a lot of the learning is actually taking place within the residences. So with online learning, this also shows to have um, a, a, a therapeutic impact on the fact that they can move away from their studies and work on the gardens. Some of the um, DET graduate attributes will also seem to be developing very well. As we can see, 70% have indicated that they're been able to demonstrate critical thinking and innovation, while about 57% has indicated that they've been able to demonstrate leadership and problem solving skills. Some of about 52% have indicated that they've had inclusive interactions and engagement, whilst the remaining letter 50% also indicated that it, they were able to apply their course knowledge to sustaining the program, which also shows that with some of the, 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 the learning that is being enacted within the classroom is also being um, brought through to these co-curricular programs. So uh, with the qualitative data, because there were some open-ended questions that were asked, was to also just for the students to show that there's been some gaining of new knowledge. So students provided reflections indicating that through the One Residence, One Garden project, skills, uh, gardening skills have been improved as they've been able to gain new knowledge through this project. We had a student from one of our residences indicating that I didn't know that there should be a sequence when planting, that you don't mix onions and cabbages in the same row and spacing should be enough for them to grow without crowding each other. Whilst another student from Walsingham was able to indicate that, I've learned that when planting seedlings, you should be able to measure from 12 to 24 away from each row, because if the seedlings are planted closer together, the head of the cabbage, I have discovered the love I have for plants. In regards to environmental sustainability, we found that first year students highlighted that the project contributes to environmental sustainability. Another student indicated that how I've discovered that the world needs more people who are willing to volunteer and sustain the environment, not only for us, but for future use as well. So what we can see here is that students are also willing to plant the gardens using efficient ways without damaging the soil and environment at large. Therefore, the One Residence, One Garden project is also ensuring environmentally sustainable ambassadors are being nurtured. And this is critical for managing climate change, which is a major challenge around the globe at the moment. In regards to mental health, mental health issues have been alleviated. Students provided reflections indicating that there was an opportunity to do something productive apart from studying. The One Residence, One Garden project was therapeutic when students are stressed, they would go on, go and work on the gardens. And this helps a lot in terms of alleviating stress that's emanating from online learning. 
So there's one of the students that indicated that these gardens are a blessing to me. When I'm stressed, I'll just take some time to take a watering can and just water a garden. So consequently, um, the One Residence, One Garden project is also providing students with, a pos with an opportunity to engage with others, which is crucial to the well-being of students. So um, from the recommendations that were brought about from the students on how can the project be improved, some of the students indicated that um, we can try look at how we can create a nursery, but also maybe how we can look at hydroponic gardens, because I think with some of the, the, the vegetables, I mean, sorry, the vegetable gardens within the residences, some residences don't have um, proper spaces and hence it would be ideal to see some other methods of gardening apart from traditional gardening, gardening methods. And um, another student also indicated, I think as what I've touched on is enhancing vertical planting in hand with hydroponics. And I think what was also interesting, there is a student that said, I think the team is doing great and I don't think there's any areas of improvement. However, there was, um, there was a need for um, students to, to, to be recruited, to be involved in the residences. So there has been a call sent out once again to the students to try and encourage more students to participate on this project. And we're also looking at how can these projects be incentivized in terms of ensuring that at the end of the day, students know that as much as they participate on these pro projects, these programs, there is some sort of recognition that is coming forth um, to, to acknowledge their efforts in, in participating on these projects. So we also saw that there was um, some indication on how we can improve by trying to do more research about planting and also protecting the environment by planting trees and avoiding soil erosion, but also looking at how we can help more vulnerable young and old people. And I think this speaks more importantly to some of the community engagement initiatives that are also being run by the Green Campus Initiative by doing some sort of um, community engagement work, whether it's with child-headed households or with our old age homes but also to just also ensure that we are breaking the silos. If I may, I may just put it in conclusion that we're also looking at strengthening collaborations within DUT with our, 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 our sister departments, such as um, there's another program called Pagambilo, which is run by the student counseling. So we're looking at how can we collaborate with our, our other departments in terms of ensuring the, the success of this project. But then I, I know I'll also give Dr. Tuku a chance to speak on the food security committee that's actually also being um, formed at the moment to also try and ensure that we, we're breaking the silos, but also strengthening some of the work that we're doing by collaborating together. But then also with regards to the program that we have, We've also touched on some engaging some external stakeholders such as botanic gardens for some training for our, our, our students, as well as um, other external, uh, external service providers such as Itikuni Municipality. Thank you very much. Thank Great. you very much for that. Uh, uh, that was very, very interesting. Uh, and I think uh, there was a comment uh, and a question. Yes, in the chat, that. please. Percy? Yes, can I, can I? Yes, Percy says, I like the connection with the DUT graduate attribute. Is this something that is built into the activities or it was measured as an afterthought? Uh, thanks, Percy, for that question. Uh, in actual fact, all the programs that we are doing now, we intentionally are creating spaces where students can actually demonstrate the DUT graduate attributes. And so with the designs of these programs, particularly around students being at the center of coming up with solutions for their own programs, we then make sure that uh, uh, with these programs that are actually designed by the students, uh, by the way, um, we then uh, sort of create them in such a way that it allows them to demonstrate that UT graduate attribute. Some of them, they know about them, some of them, they don't. And so that is why then when we do these kinds of surveys, we kind of try to understand um, what are some of the things that they would have learned from the programs. And if then this links also with the UT graduate attributes. And, and of course, in this particular survey, we kind of gave them, uh, you know, some ideas of what they are. And we actually are seeing them uh, coming through into in, into what the students actually says they've benefited from the program. Uh, yeah, so definitely built in. Thanks. 
Okay, I think that was confirmed by Ku as well. Definitely built in. Thank you very much for that. Uh, are there any other questions that you would like to put on the post? Uh, while we're waiting, I think uh, I, would, I would like to say that uh, this, this uh, project or program, I think has got uh, a lot of potential. If, if you consider the disciplines uh, that exist at, at DUT and, and how they would feed into this quite, quite naturally, you know, uh, agriculture, uh, chemistry, uh, microbiology, uh, soil science, there's a lot of things. So it's, it's something that can actually grow and become very meaningful and have uh, a very strong alignment with the disciplines at the, at the institution, uh, including nutrition, uh, you know, dietetics, all of those uh, areas. So I see a great, great uh, future for this. Uh, and, uh, and I think from, from the activities and from the feedback of students, Clearly, I think they, they've also, uh, you know, supported the benefits uh, that they derive from this. Uh, and uh, Delicia is, is uh, also reminding us that uh, horticulture uh, as uh, well can contribute uh, to this initiative. Thank you, Delicia. Uh, you want to add see, to that, Delicia? I see that Kupaka's hand is also up. And there's okay. a second hand that has just gone up. So maybe cool first. Okay. Th thanks, Ibrahim. Thanks, Bala. And yes, you actually took the words right out of my mouth, Bala. Uh, it was just to build also on what Kosi said in her towards the end of her presentation about the collaboration and the, the breaking down of silos. So with uh, the One Race One Garden, uh, Delisha, you are correct. Um, the, the program does actually work with the our Department of uh, Horticulture. But apart from that, you know, we are during the rest of this year we're going to be building very uh, deliberate linkages with the vibrant campuses in. Initiative. Um, those of you who happen to attend um, our partner presentation this morning, uh, you would have heard uh, two of our students from vibrant campuses, and we're going to see a lot more linkages and working with OROG there, uh, particularly on the nutritional aspects. So, so these um, healthy foods, uh, crops that are being, uh, you know, cultivated, uh, then take it one step further in terms of the recipes and how to actually uh, translate them into into healthier eating. And then above and beyond that, and Kosi did mention this, was that uh, we've got some linkages with our entrepreneurship desk and. Innovers, um, the opportunities here of the surplus crops being sold, um, and then even further in terms of um, capacity building in our communities. And I think this is uh, definitely being planned, um, especially in, in the Midlands campus with the Mbali precinct. So the uh, neighboring communities, uh, the students who are involved in the OROG will then go out and actually capacitate um, the communities in terms of, of, of food gardens. Uh, thanks so much, Bala. Thank you. Thank you for that input. Uh, uh, Delicia, would you like it? Say something. Um, uh, no, 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 thanks. I think Ku has, has, has said already what I was going to speak about. But just to say, it's good to see these projects actually going on at the universities. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. You know, it's good to see some competition for these fast, fast food outlets for one. Uh, and, and, you know, there's uh, a greater you know, thinking about, yeah. about healthy living and, and alternatives, uh, and also about the environment. I think that's, that's really important, it's coming across, uh, you know, the issues of climate change. Um, okay, uh, are there any other comments? Uh, if Prime is anything else uh, on yeah. there? I don't see any more questions in the chat space, neither do I see any hand up. Okay, I think uh, we are getting to that uh, part of the session. Uh, it's getting late. So can we move on to the final uh, presentation? Okay. Uh, the last presentation is by Rosa Hatherji, the nexus between teaching and community engagement in an undergraduate uh, curriculum. Uh, Rosa, over to you. Uh, please leave us at least five minutes for questions at the end. Uh, thank you, Bala, I'll do that. Uh, let me just get my correct screen up here. There All right, go. here we go. I just need to get that uh, enlarged. Okay. 
Okay. Okay, got that in the way. There we go. All right, so I'm Firoza Hafaji, and my topic is the nexus between teaching community engagement in an undergraduate curriculum. And I'm also from DUT. Looks like this is a full DUT session, which is nice. <laughs> All right, so what was the rationale and objective behind the study? Um, in recent times, we have seen a shift from universities being purely teaching and research institutions to include community engagement as part of their role. However, we've noticed that often these three aspects are dealt with separately. We teach in some modules, we may research uh, within the same field, but often some in some things that are not directly related to the undergraduate curriculum. Um, and some of us might go out into communities and do a little bit of um, help here and there, maybe run some uh, feeding scheme projects uh, or donate clothing, et cetera. And we say that we've done our bit for community engagement. Um, so what this project is trying to do is to try and link these three together. Um, Whilst we're seeing the shift where we need to um, incorporate community engagement into the undergraduate curriculum, there has also been a shift from solely didactic teaching of the curriculum to self-directed learning. Previous studies have shown that this has improved learning as well as critical thinking. And this study used a photo voice project, which is a participatory method to engage health science students in a project um, in order to enhance their learning as well as to engage them within local communities or environments in order to improve both the surroundings as well as improve the health of the people in the area. Um, so part of this project I uh, worked on previously, but I built up on it. Um, and so this uh, presentation today is going to be more on the bits that I have built up with, but um, I'll go over uh, the entire methodology to show you what was actually done. So the photo voice assignment was presented to students registered for epidemiology, public health, and for the purposes of today's talk, it's for the students registered in 2021. In total, there were, uh, there were a total of 22 students within this year group. And they worked in self-selected groups of approximately per group. The to think about local factors that go out in environment photographs of these factors which they thought were causing the disease. There were no restrictions on the number of photographs that were taken, and the photographs could have either been taken individually by uh, group members on their own, or they could have gone out collectively uh, in their group to take the photographs. That was left entirely to them. They could also use whatever device that they had at hand. So uh, they were permitted to use their cell phones or if they had tablets or cameras, then those were permitted as well. The group then needed to get together and have a discussion um, uh, about their different photographs, particularly if they had more than one photograph and they had to decide uh, on the factors within that photograph, uh, which were depicted within the uh, photograph, the environmental factors that actually affected the health of the people. Now this part here of the study is new, uh, where the students were, act, were subsequently required to work within the same community and assist that community in improving those environmental conditions. I also required photographic evidence of this community engagement. The students then had to present this and presentations were held on MS Teams because of the COVID-19 restrictions. Um, the assessments were based on the picture, on the quality of the picture, on how what they discussed about the picture, the importance of the picture, on the intervention that the students actually had, um, on the presentation quality, as well as the ability to answer questions. So the students worked in varied environments, um, ranging from informal settlements to polluted rivers, uh, I must say there was a, uh, in the previous years when I held, uh, had this assignment without uh, community engagement, there was really a predominance on uh, informal settlements. 
And those students that came from the cities were uh, more concerned about pollutants. And uh, there were lots of pictures that came through from the Durban South Basin, for example, and they spoke about environmental conditions in uh, those areas. But this time around, because they had to actually go and do the intervention, um, they tended to, um, uh, uh, to focus on either informal settlements or polluted rivers, I suppose it was easy for them to go out into these environments to work within the environment uh, as part of the community engagement project. Um, in all of these, the students indicated quite clearly how the adverse living conditions in the informal settlements contributed to disease, uh, similarly for the other environments as well. And there was an association of the diseases that they learned in previous sections of the module with what they went out and did in the environment. So for example, um, in the previous uh, semester, they had learned about um, parasitic diseases like Bilharzia, uh, Entamoeba, Giardia, or Travelers di Diarrhea, um, tapeworm diseases, etc. And they, were, they uh, linked these diseases very clearly with the environmental conditions that they saw. Um, regarding the informal settlements, there was much concern raised about uh, overcrowding in the inf uh, informal settlements, and they linked this to the spread of communicable diseases, a very easy spread of TB, respiratory diseases, and even COVID-19. Private water and sanitation was also a major problem as well as to those in rural areas. Um, yeah, so I've spoken about this where they articulated how overcrowding caused these conditions. They also articulated how overcrowding would lead to mental uh, illnesses as well. So um, they were able to link um, uh, the conditions, the environmental conditions, to a wide range of these. Uh, I'm now going to focus on some of the projects that the students did uh, and on the uh, community engagement that they actually came up with um, and, and what they did there. So I'm using a few of the student examples to show you. All right, so there was a major concern about um, informal settlements because there was municipal services in these informal settlements. And these included things like garbage removal, uh, lack of sanitation, um, uh, no toilets being provided. They spoke about uh, portable toilets being provided in some instances in the, uh, in the informal settlements in urban areas, but uh, the portable toilets were not cleaned regularly. Uh, as a result, people used the surrounding bushes to relieve themselves. Uh, this posed a danger, particularly at night, particularly to females, and there was an increase in gender-based violence in these areas, and they linked it to the lack of uh, municipal services that were provided. However, this picture doesn't actually show that. This, um, there were pictures that showed that as well, but this picture is showing us uh, the lack of garbage removal, and here we see um, that because uh, garbage was not removed and there were no bins being provided in the area, the people actually dumped their waste um, behind the informal settlements, often on slopey banks um, that were leading down to a water source, as we can see here. So there was contamination of local water sources, which was used for the downstream pollution of the water. And here we see a close-up of that same area and we can see um, the extreme nature of this uh, pollutants and it's getting into the river there. And we know with the, with the recent floods and the debris that was lying around on the beaches, etc., there's definite downstream pollution of this waste. Okay, so what did the students do about this? They engaged with the community, they embarked on education drives within the community. The residents were taught about the importance of boiling the river water because they were using that same water for the drinking and cooking, as I've mentioned already. Um, and so they taught them to boil uh, the water. They also taught them, um, there's a little formula that they found about um, putting in was that type of education. Um, community 
um, reducing recycling and using uh, um, and they guided and, them on you know, eliminating you're, waste you're and the up, environment. Uh, you're breaking up. Uh, would you mind uh, switching off your video? Let's see if it helps. Go ahead. Uh, we can't hear you at all now. Yeah, there seems to be a connection issue. Uh, okay, we have some time, so we will wait to see if we can resume connection connectivity. Rosa, are you there? We, we've lost. I, th I think she's she's dropped now. Okay, let's see if she tries and maybe try she and will she will okay. come back. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your patience, colleagues. You're back, uh, Feroz, I think. Mm. We can see your slide. Uh, you can continue as soon as you can. Okay. All right, can you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, great. All right, so the students embarked on education drives within the community. They taught them uh, about the importance of boiling water and other methods of purifying the water before using it for drinking and cooking. Um, they also educated them about recycling waste and about the proper elimination of waste. And um, uh, uh, they were taught to actually dig uh, pit holes and uh, bury the waste instead of throwing it uh, on uh, slopey banks leading into rivers, etc or even uh, in the other surrounding areas. So that resulted in less pollution in the area. In addition, uh, they also put up posters. So there was some sustainability that was ensured so that uh, if residents did see these posters at a later stage, they would hopefully uh, continue to avoid uh, polluting the environment. Um, the students initiated cleanup programs within the community, and here we can see the students uh, actually cleaning up these areas here. Um, and um, uh, they actually this actually promoted a distinctive education, which promoted a green ecosystem uh, by improving the local environments. Uh, the students wrote letters of appeal on behalf of the communities, and these letters were then sent to the municipalities and other governmental structures. Uh, they requested services in the area. Um, uh, some of the services that they requested were uh, garbage removal. They also re uh, requested um, that skip bins be provided to these informal settlements so that they have bins to actually throw the rubbish in and then for these uh, to be emptied out on a regular basis as occurs within formal settlements. One group initiated a cleaning campaign where they recruited members of the community as well as other, other people via social media to assist in the cleanup operations. Um, and this was their Facebook um, and uh, Instagram post, which they put up where they sought volunteers to assist them in cleaning up a park. They also put up other social media posts to teach people about how to utilize rainwater, for example. Um, and uh, this is an uh, this, these are pictures of uh, uh, this project where the students uh, uh, recruited people via social media. Um, and this is actually a stream that is passing through a park. Um, and it's, it's a lovely park when you see the entire picture of the park. Um, it's a large area with trees and shrubs and bushes. 
um, and it's got benches, etc., to relax on. But there's lots of litter lying around in the area, and the litter finds its way into the stream that's running through the park. Um, and in places, uh, there's a lot of accumulation of plastic, and there's an enlargement of that area there. And we see all the plastic that's uh, accumulating in that area. And if this plastic has to remain in this area for a long time because of the damp, there's going to be lots of bacteria, viruses, etc., that are going to now accumulate in this area and grow in that area as well. Um, so they linked all of that to uh, bacterial infections, viral infections. They also spoke about parasitic diseases that could be um, uh, prevalent in those uh, in in the water in that area. And here's a picture of uh, the students together with people in the community that they recruited via Facebook, etc., to come and assist them in cleaning up the area there. So again, they promoted a green ecosystem and they promoted sustainability of keeping this place clean by involving the community in this work. Um, and here we see the end result uh, of the park. Uh, we've now got a clean park, uh, no more litter in the area, no more litter in the river as well. Uh, people are sitting there on the bench now and enjoying a little picnic. This is an example of another student's project. Uh, this group uh, worked in the Moy River area in KwaZulu Natal. And uh, here we see a broken sewage system as well as illegal dumping. And all of this, the, the, the water from the sewage is uh, leaking out into a little stream. Um, the litter is also um, uh, going through into the stream, which eventually flows out through into a large river. The water channel is contaminated with both feces as well as waste materials. Um, and they noted that it served as a breeding ground for parasites, bacteria, and viruses as well. Uh, people use the water from the stream as well as from the larger river for drinking, washing, cooking, as well as bathing. Um, these people are all at high risk of infections such as Shisusoma, which causes Bilharzia, uh, Entamoeba hysterotica, which causes uh, diarrhea. And um, they linked this to the prevalence of these diseases in the area. And they did some additional reading on these diseases, and they found that people within these areas um, uh, had a high prevalence of both Bilharzia as well as um, uh, Entamoeba infections. Now that same stream which we saw in the previous picture leads further down into a larger stream. And this is a picture of the stream as we go um, lower down. So it's the same stream uh, which is now continuing. Um, and we can see the dirt lying around in this area here as well. But what was very concerning to the students was this area here, which I've now enlarged here. And we see a dead goat lying in that area. And they linked the death of that goat to uh, possibly eating pollutants that were lying in the area. Um, uh, obviously, they couldn't prove that, uh, uh, but there was further concern raised about the dead animal lying here because that was now going to rot and um, attract vultures in the area, also going to attract uh, more bacteria and other pathogens into the area. And all of that is now going to lead off into the stream again, um, which is going to be used as a water source uh, for the residents uh, in surrounding areas. Rainfall is, of course, going to exacerbate the situation by taking this, uh, the waste material further down into larger areas. Um, this group also educated the residents about making an open pit where they could throw and bury the waste. They taught the residents about recycling plastic waste bags uh, to make grass mats, baskets, etc. And they assisted them in making these grass mats and baskets um, and in uh, trying to get the residents to sell these grass mats and baskets um, uh, to local stores, etc. Uh, so there could be some income that could then come through from this as well. They also spoke to them about water purification. And this is an example of the poster that they put up in the area. Um, to teach them about uh, not polluting the area uh, and about um, trying to clean the water before actually using it. This is an example of a very different uh, project. This, uh, uh, this was uh, in the Warwick Avenue Triangle in Durban. And here we see the street sellers on the pavements. 
um, the concern that was raised here was that the fruit and vegetable are exposed to the sun because of the lack of shelter in these areas. Um, uh, in particular, this one here, we can see there is no shelter over that area there. And they felt that the fruit and veggies would rot and uh, would then cause some other diseases. Um, they were more concerned about uh, COVID-19 uh, protocol not being observed in the area. They observed that there was no social distancing uh, maintained in this area. Um, uh, the vendors were not wearing masks, neither were any of the uh, local people that were walking through the area or buying through the area wearing masks. So that was a major concern that the students felt and uh, they linked that to the spread of COVID-19. Um, they purchased masks and gloves um, and they handed these out to vendors as well as to the public in the area. And they also had some education drives on COVID-19. So we find that there was a varied um, type of project that came through as well. So overall, we find that this contemporary learning design permitted the students to critically analyze their own as well as surrounding environments. It created a space for the students to work in um, and for the students to work within these environments and within the communities that lived within these environments. In doing so, they improved the living conditions in order to improve the health of the people. The students appreciated interacting with the communities by providing the health advice and assistance. Uh, students also expressed that the assignment taught them to collaborate with each other as well as with local communities. Overall, this project generated a mindset that would make them concerned about societal issues that were well beyond the classroom and this formulated a lifelong learning process. And this would be very important for them in their future careers, whether it is cleaning up the environment or any other concern that could be raised in the community because they now become suddenly socially aware and uh, uh, aware of social justice um, projects that they can come up with. So oh, um, in conclusion, this community engagement project can be incorporated into teaching in an undergraduate curriculum. We need to think a little bit out of the box to find uh, different types of community engagement projects, which each of us could include within our own curriculum. Um, by engaging with the local community, the students can develop into adaptive graduates who will be able to respond to societal needs. And I thank you for listening to me. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much uh, for that, Rosa. Sorry about the little glitch we had, but I think we did it well. Uh, if Rav, is there any? Yeah, no, I don't see any questions in the chat space, but there's one comment from Ku. Writing to local authorities on behalf of the community is a great idea. I'm hoping that they did receive assistance. Mr. Rosa, do you know if they? Got a response? I don't know whether they actually got a response or not because uh, they presented the project uh, before they actually received a response from the community. And uh, this was done towards the end of last semesters. And um, I lose the students at the end of the second year and they're now in third year. So I didn't uh, have further communication with the students. However, what I can report on is that um, I asked the top three groups of uh, students to actually enter in the DOT community engage for the DOT community engagement awards. And I was very pleased that two uh, of those groups won uh, prizes. Um, and their prizes were for them to continue with community engagement. So each of those groups won a sum of 2,500 rands, which they have committed to using in future uh, community engagement projects. Uh, so there is some sustainability that is going to come through. I will be liaising with the students, although they are now in their third year, I will be liaising with them in the second semester again, because I teach this module in the second semester. So I want the current group of students to actually link up with the previous students so that we can have continuity with the work. So um, I will only be able to answer that question next semester, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, fantastic that they won uh, uh, that prize in recognition of what they've done. Uh, so the comments, uh, two more comments, one from Jan, very impact, impactful, both for the communities and for the students. And another one from Maeve, very impressive moving, very impressive and moving. 
excellent example of education for the whole person. Thank you. Another, another comment from Jan again. I'm curious about the impact on learning for students in these efforts. Uh, okay, yes. so could I also go ahead? Uh, yeah, the, the impact on learn. There was an impact on learning. It wasn't just about them going out and and doing this work because they needed to link up everything with the curriculum because this was a public health module. So, um, uh, as I mentioned, I, I had previously taught them about the diseases, for example, bilharzia, uh, diarrhea, etc. And so they were able to link this uh, with those uh, diseases. In the public health module, they also learn about things like um, prevalence, incidence, um, and um, um, uh, the stats that go with it as, as well. Um, uh, you know, the, the basic, basic statistics um, that, that are used in epidemiological studies. Uh, and so uh, a lot of them went uh, further and looked at these statistics um, within the communities, the prevalence and incidences of diseases, and they linked these up to the environmental conditions. Um, they were also able to triangulate data. Um, they were able to link up how diseases would occur um, with the link between host factors, environmental factors, as well as the presence of the pathogen. So it's not just the, the presence of the pathogen that causes diseases, but the other two factors are also important. And of course, in this, uh, we noticed that a lot of, um, whilst they focused on the environmental conditions, there were a lot of um, host factors that were important here as well, because the host factors of people that are living in those informal settlements are going to be different from host factors of people that are living in higher socioeconomic uh, areas, for example. Um, their physiological status may be different, their nutritional status is going to be different, and so they're going to be more susceptible to disease, and uh, the students were very um, capable of making those links. Thank you for that. I think, uh, if I'm to, we have a few more comments before we finish off. Yes, um, there's one comment from Ku, a great example of problem-based learning too, I would think, uh, and he's thankful to you for that. Another one from Jan. This model shows promise to meet some of the conditions Dr. Green mentioned about connecting student learning outcomes with their postgraduate status. Jan, you would like to say a little more on that? Certainly. I, as I understood uh, what Woody Green was mentioning is that um, uh, universities will be uh, looking also at how um, their graduates of, you know, completers of, of uh, qualifications will do in the workplace. And yeah. it seems to me that this sort of, of model that is being shown here shows great promise of helping prepare students for both the uh, foundational theoretical learning, but also the very pragmatic aspect of how that is applied in a real world situation. I'm, I find this very exciting and a very uh, useful presentation. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. The extended notion of uh, student success that he mentioned, yeah. Yeah, uh, fantastic. I, I, I think this is uh, absolutely right. It's, it's a real life situation. It shows a very, very good nexus have been teaching in the community. And I think it also gives uh, a bit more meaning to the community engagement. You know, unfortunately over the years, people had different interpretations of what that meant, uh, but I think this makes it much more meaningful and much more sustainable. And quite clearly, I think students uh, would benefit tremendously from this experience and, and enhance their learning. Uh, folks, I, I think uh, I want to thank all of you for staying up uh, so late especially uh, people from far away as well, Jan. Uh, our presenters, well done, excellent work. Keep up the good work. And uh, thank you, everybody. And, and we'll see you tomorrow. So have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bala. Thank you. Bye. Bye.